Hello, good day to one and all. This is Ms. A. Krishna Sundar, Assistant Professor, Department of English from KAHM Unity Women's College, Mancheri. Today, we are going to have an overview on the theoretical aspect of psychoanalysis. As all of you know, psychoanalysis is one of the most complex theories and it is still a theory which remains controversial and debatable. So before we start with the theoretical aspect, this is Sigmund Freud and here you can see Jacques Lacan. Now Freud was basically from Austria whereas Lacan was from France. So these are the two important figures or maybe the proponents behind most of the theoretical aspects in psychoanalysis. So before we start, let's get into the biographical details of Freud. He was born in 1856 at Moravia, which is now at Czech Republic. He was the first born son of Jacob and Emily. He was born with a call which his mother related as a good omen. Now, a call is actually a membrane that encloses the fetus within the womb. So he was born with this call and his mother considered this as a good omen. At 17, he enters the University of Vienna. He began his medical career in the year 1882 at the General Hospital in Vienna. So Vienna, which is the capital of Austria. In 1885, he visits Paris and he learns about hypnosis, which is what we call as hypnotism in today's concept. In 1886, he resigned and then started his private practice. He married Bhatta Banas. Rumors and relation with Mina Banas, who is actually Mata's sister, had also been a part of his career. He was a chain smoker and he often said that smoking increased his capacity to work. He had a deep interest in Shakespearean plays and he used hypnotism, free association and dream interpretation to connect with his patients. In 1896, the term psychoanalysis was coined for the very first time. And in the year 1910, he started a discussion group, which was known as IPA, which is actually International Psychoanalytical Association at London. He passed away in 1939 from London. So you can see this is a photograph of his parents, Jacob and Amali. Now moving on, you can see this was Freud's first home. Now this was the home where he settled after his marriage. Now, due to Nazi persecution during the period, he had to flee to London, and this is his last home in London. So, moving on to the theoretical aspect, what exactly is psychoanalysis? Now, most of the literary theories are very difficult to learn, and it is not very interesting to read those essays. So this entire video lecture will enable you to understand the essence of psychoanalysis and the major technical terms which are coming within this umbrella term, psychoanalysis. So what exactly is psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis is a theory related with personality development. It is a type of therapy provided to the clients. Now, this line has to be emphasized because till this date, mental disruption was treated with medicines or prescriptions related with that. But it was Freud for the very first time who started clinical kind of therapy with his clients. So psychoanalysis can be considered as a therapy which was provided to clients, which actually began with the career of Freud. 
Now, hysteria was very common among women during the Victorian age, and many women actually went through a suffocating period. And the main aim here was to bring out those thought processes within the unconscious to the conscious level. So that is what we call as hypnosis. So this was done for the very first time by Freud because medicinal kind of prescriptions were avoided and Freud started talking to his patients directly and through hypnosis. Now the most influential as well as the controversial thinker Sigmund Freud was the very first one to start with this clinical therapy thereby communicating and connecting with his clients. So moving on, just to brush up your memory with the previous details which we had gone through. So Freud is an Austrian neurologist and the founder of psychoanalysis. He used clinical method for treating psychopathology. He considered communication as an important tool in connecting with his patients. He was born to Jewish parents. He became a doctor at the University of Vienna. He started his clinical practice in 1886. Due to Nazi persecution, he left Austria and he settled at London. Again, when we talk about his clinical therapy, Dr. Joseph and his patient Anna O, they were able to cure her when she was given chance to bring out her previous traumatic experience. So this is the first case study which gave confidence for Freud to continue with his clinical therapy. Now maybe these names are fictional names but this is what he has mentioned in one of his papers. Now this sparked Freud's interest in the unconscious and in the development of a few theories. Moving on, a few more pictures which I would like to show you when I visited Freud's clinic as a part of my PhD thesis because my PhD thesis had Freudian theories connecting with the representation of women in movies. So you can see this is Freud Museum and this was the table, the sofa, the couch which were used by Freud. Now this is very important, the couch, because most of his patients used to lie down in this couch while Freud started communicating with them, communicating with their unconscious. So some of the major theories that Freud has developed, definitions on sexuality, Oedipal complex, dream analysis, death drive. There are many more, but we are just talking about the main ideologies that he had brought into psychology, literature, anthropology, sociology, etc. So moving on to the first part of Freud's analysis, id, ego and superego. Now this can be considered as a tripartite structure in psychoanalytical theory. Now this is actually considered as a psychic apparatus because if you analyze these three elements, it is easy to understand the characteristics of a human being. Now this is a structural mode of psyche which Freud has given. He says that a person's personality is a result of the actions and interactions of id, ego and superego, which means these three segments will create the mental life of a person. Or in simple terms, you can say that these three elements will bring the balance in the mental life of a person. So let's move on to the first part, id. Okay, so what is id? We are going to define this term. It is the primitive and instinctual component, which means it is present right from the moment of your birth. The moment you are born, there is id in you. It starts right from the birth. 
More than that, it is an impulsive component or you can also call it as a survival component and that could be the reason why babies often cry. Whenever they want something, whenever they are in need, they make use of this id. They cry and they get what they want. So this is an impulsive component because the moment you feel like you want something, you want it right at that moment. There is no compromise for id. It needs instant gratification and that is why we say there is no compromise for it. Immediate response to urges, desires and needs. In fact, it is an infantile expression. Now it is called as an infantile expression because as a baby grows into an adult, the graph of this id will actually go down. Because it will be controlled by the other two elements. But in the case of a baby, there is only id present in the baby. There is no ego or superego. The other two elements are not present in a small baby or in a small child. And that is why the, these children, they require immediate a response to their urges. They have no compromising quality because if they want something, they want something right at that moment. And that is why it is called as an infantile expression. But it remains in our minds throughout. Now see, once you are born, it is there. And once this it is there in your mind, it is never ever going to move away. The only difference is that as you grow up, the other two elements will also start forming in your mind, that is ego and superego. And when these two elements start interacting, the intensity or gravity of id will automatically reduce. But even then, at times id can pop out. And that is the reason why sometimes even when we are adults, even when we know that this is not going to happen, sometimes we are very stubborn about certain things. Sometimes you want something right at this moment or you want to go out right at this moment. Even when people around you might discourage you that you cannot go out now, it is raining or maybe some other uh, concerns, you will not be bothered about it. You want to go out right now. At that point of time, you are an adult, you are matured, but still your id graph is very high at that point of time, which means id can come out, it can pop up at any moment. It remains in our minds throughout. And id is based on the pleasure principle. As we discussed earlier, if you want something you want an instant gratification. You cannot wait and you cannot compromise. And the best example would be small kids asking to bring the moon. Now that is the best example for it because they do not know anything about the realistic part. What they want is they want the moon to be in their hands and they cry for that. So that is why it is always considered as an infantile expression. Now it is primitive illogical and fantasy oriented and that is why we say reality is not considered when we talk about id. No objective reality is happening here and is always wishful in nature. Now Freud talked about this in the year 1933 during his new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis. So it is actually the dark, inaccessible part of our personality. So as we grow older, the graph of id becomes reduced. So just have a look at this picture. Now Freud says that a child is born with the id. The id plays a vital role in one's personality because as a baby, it works so that the baby's essential needs are met. The id operates on the pleasure needs. It focuses on immediate gratification or satisfaction of its needs. Now you can see the baby who is really angry because the baby wants milk right now. And there is no reality principle. If it wants it right now, it wants it right now. That's all. So there is no compromise. Now moving on to the second part. This is ego. Now, ego is that part of the id which has been modified by the direct influence of the external world. 
which means as id grows up ego is also in its formative stage and when ego starts growing ego will start controlling id so there is a direct influence of the external world as you grow up now ego is the decision making component of the mind which means in simple terms it stands between unrealistic id and reality so remember id is always unrealistic because it just runs behind pleasure principle whereas ego is based on reality and ego is manifested by reason it tries to satisfy its demands in a realistic way now see ego is never against id ego tries to satisfy its needs in a realistic way so that is a difference so social realities rules and norms in a society these things are considered by ego it analyzes and finds a realistic solution now if id is a horse ego can be the rider which means it is ego which starts controlling id as we grow up so moving on to the last part we have super ego so super ego includes the values and morals of a society so that is conscience and the ideal self now please do not get confused with ego and super ego because ego means it is about social reality what is happening around is right now but super ego means the values and morals that we have inherited through our culture maybe from our parents from our teachers from our religion from our society the moral values that will directly get into your mind so that is in every way different from ego the values we learn from our parents and our culture so if i give you an example it is going to be easy for you because a malayali child born in kerala atmosphere and a canadian child born and brought up in canada if you look at these two children their super ego elements would be different because they live in two different cultures they live in two different societies the values are different uh, morality elements are different everything is different so something that the malayali child thinks to be something wrong might not be considered as wrong by the canadian child because their moralistic cultural values are different so super ego will be different for people from different cultures different countries etc you cannot make a comparison here so these are values that we learn and freud says that most of these values are learned between the age of 3 and 5 which is the psychosexual developmental stage now to control the its impulses so super ego 2 will help you to control the impulses from it because it will always have sex aggression and violence within it but your super ego your values might tell you you are not supposed to get into it so this is more moralistic in nature and this is a platform which will make you feel guilty and sometimes it can make you feel great according to your deeds so super ego means the values inherited from childhood so this will help you to distinguish between right and wrong so rewards and punishments good and bad heaven and hell so all these binary oppositions can actually come within super ego as per your cultural values so this will be more into realistic goals more than that moralistic goals so now if you look at id ego and super ego this is how it works now on the conscious level you have ego on the preconscious level you have the super ego and the unconscious level you will be having id which includes all the basic impulses or maybe you can even call it as animal instincts now when you are in the social space 
I repeat, when you are in a social space, maybe in your college or maybe in your campus, what is projected from you is only the ego part. Your superego part is hidden. It is completely unknown to you. So what is projected outside, that is just the ego part. So this again will make you understand how it works. Conscious level, pre-conscious level and unconscious level. Now see, look at the unconscious level. That is where it comes. Your fears, sexual desires, violent motives, immoral urges. Now see, sometimes when you're really angry, you feel like killing somebody. Now that urge is actually coming from this id. But your ego will tell you, do not do that. Because if you kill somebody, you will be arrested. And your super ego will tell you, it is not right to kill another human being. It is a crime. So see, one will tell you about the moralistic side, that is super ego. Ego will tell you about the consequences, the realistic part. So I hope that part is clear. So a few more examples will help you to understand it in a better way. Now look at id. It says, I want it now. Now ego says, I need to do a bit of planning to get it. Now super ego says, you cannot have it. It is not right. So I think the functions are very clear with this diagrammatical representation. Now look at this example. It is telling you, I want to eat chocolate. Now ego will tell you, Eat a small bar of chocolate. Now, superego will remind you, oh, I'm on a super diet. So this is how they interact with each other and produce a balance in our mind. Now, with this telling you, I want to do that now. Now, ego will tell you, maybe we can compromise and superego will be telling you it is not right to do that. So this is, in fact, the correct picturization. It is actually satanic in its nature with all the instincts. It could go to any extent, whereas ego is running behind reality principle and superego is something which is always connected with the moralistic aspects. So now we are moving on to the next part, that is dream mechanism. So dream mechanism, again, is put forward by Freud with his landmark publication, The Interpretation of Dreams, which was published in the year 1900. Now, it is a theory related with the dreaming process. Now, Freud suggested that dreams can be a conscious experience of the unconscious because we ourselves do not know what we hold in the unconscious part. So whatever is there, it is just popping up in the conscious experience in the form of dreams. So he even used psychoanalytic dream interpretation as a therapy for his clients. Now this is a theory which is still controversial and still debatable. Now, dreams were defined as a disguised representation of unfulfilled desires. Now, see, this is a theoretical aspect. You can agree with it or you can disagree with it because this theory is not completely furnished in its scientific way. There are lots of controversies and debates which are still going on with these theoretical aspects. So, all said and done, one thing that we can admit is dreams can be considered as a road to the unconscious. It is a main tool for self-analysis. This is what Freud says. Now, dreams can be divided into two forms. One is the manifested content and the other one is the latent content. Now, I'm sure when we dream, the very next day, sometimes we will be able to get a recap of our dreams. Sometimes you will get the feeling that I've seen so many things, but it's like a collage. I just can't remember any of those things. So these are the two variations of dreams that we experience. So one is manifested content, what we remember after we wake up. The other one is latent content. Now that which comes from the unconscious, and maybe that is why we cannot remember that completely or continuously. Now, ego and superego will not interfere 
during your sleep so when you sleep the only thing that is awake is actually your unconscious or you can also call it as id ego and super ego will not interfere you in your sleep and because of that your sleep can give you a visual fantasy because whatever you have in your unconscious it can come out during your sleep during your dream so now let's move into the different kinds of dreams one is condensation now condensation as you might have studied in your science books condensation and evaporation so just like that condensation means several unconscious wishes impulses and attitudes they merge into one image so the best example would be the poem the wasteland there are so many things coming together they are connected but they are disconnected at the same time so this is what you call as condensation then comes displacement from an original object to a substitute object so instead of seeing the real important object you will be seeing something else which could be a trivial one the next one is projection now unacceptable wishes are projected through other characters suppose you are planning to go and study in america instead of that you keep seeing that your friend is going to america for higher study so this is what you call as projection then comes symbolic representation seeing ideas or objects related to certain specific unconscious dreams now normally it is said that snakes snakes can be considered as a symbol of sexuality next one is secondary revision when the events in the unconscious are ordered that is when conscious interferes so sometimes when you get up from a dream you will not have a complete order of the things you have seen in the dream but sometimes your conscious in a very in very rare cases your conscious can interfere and your conscious can bring an order to the unconscious level dreams that you have witnessed now this is what you call as secondary revision so all said and done whatever you see in dreams they come from your repressed desire this is what freud says so moving on to the next part edipal complex now this is one of the most controversial theories ever put forward and in simple terms it is a sexual desire for the parent of the opposite sex a rivalry with the parent of the same sex for example a boy having an unhealthy relationship with the mother and the boy treats his father who is from the same sex as an opponent so competing with one parent for the possession of the other so it works in the very same way with a girl if it is a girl the girl has an unhealthy relationship with the father and she starts hating the mother who is of the same sex now this was introduced by freud and it was first introduced in his book interpretation of dreams which he wrote in the year 1899 and it was published in 1900 now this is based on the greek hero oedipus and the complex is also named after this greek hero and it was given the name in the year 1910 now the reverse order comes with electra complex now electra complexes instead of boy the girl is having the unhealthy relationship with the father and she starts hating the mother now these complexes were later dealt by the students of freud and one was carl jung So as discussed before 3 to 5 years this is the psychosexual stages of development. So what are the signs of Oedipal complex? Now I can see this is a theory which is still remaining controversial so you can agree to it you can disagree with it that's up to you. I'm just pointing out what Freud said. And that doesn't mean that I'm agreeing or disagreeing with the theoretical aspects. This is what comes as a part of the theories of Freud. if the same sex parent is loving it is forgotten with the help of superego this is what freud says but if it is unresolved mother fixation happens just like you can see in the character of paul with gertrude morel in the novel sons and lovers written by d h lawrence again the same kind of elements can be watched even in the character of hamlet Now there is another term that 
Freud had mentioned, which is known as penis envy, which means during the psychosexual stage, that is between three to five years, girls often are jealous with boys. And he calls the term as penis envy. Now, how far this is actually authentic or how far this is relatable is another question, but this is a theory that Freud had suggested. But as an answer for this, Another feminist, Karen Horney, had actually given another term as womb envy, which she says is a kind of jealousy that men feel towards women because they do not have womb just like women. Okay, so moving on. Oedipal complex, to sum up, the boy's id desires to kill the father, but the ego realizes that his father is more stronger. So maybe the boy fears of castration. So this is how this is analyzed from the perspective of Freud. So the conflict is finally resolved when he identifies himself with the father in the light of superego. So superego interferes, ego interferes and the problem is resolved. So now moving on to the next term that is unconscious. Now unconscious is an extension of what we had already discussed with the term id. Now, this term was first coined by Frederick Schelling, a German psychologist. Now, even Samuel Taylor Coleridge has spoken about this unconscious in his literary text, Biography Literaria, where he talks about the distinction between fancy and imagination. And Coleridge says that imagination is more creative because it is connected with the unconscious. So indirectly, Coleridge had talked about this years before Freud came up with this theory of unconscious. So it became more popular from Freud's psychoanalytic theory, from the theory of personality. So what exactly is unconscious? No introspection is possible with the unconscious. Even today, what lies in the unconscious of a human being has not been identified by any scientific solution or scientists or psychologists. So unconscious is a reservoir of feelings, emotions and urges. Mostly unacceptable or unpleasant feelings. So there is tension, there is conflict, there is guilt. The conscious can never realize these feelings. So that is the reason why there is an iceberg comparison. The tip shows the conscious part. So just look at the picture here. Now what is known to you about yourself is just the tip. The major three-fourth of the entire mental setup is actually hidden. So that is why this iceberg comparison becomes very important here. So this is the conscious mind, pre-conscious mind and unconscious mind. So conscious mind is ego, pre-conscious mind is superego and unconscious mind is id. Though they happen beneath the conscious level, it can exert an influence on one's behavior. So just because it is hidden, do not think that it cannot influence you. It can influence you in different ways, in unknown ways. According to Freud, these unconscious emotions and feelings can cause a number of problems like bias, anger, relationship problems, etc. Again, Freud believed that while the unconscious mind is largely inaccessible, the contents can sometimes bubble up unexpectedly, such as in dreams or slips of the tongue. So sometimes the unconscious can pop up through dreams or sometimes it can be a slip of tongue. I'm sure you might have heard about this term, slip of tongue. Now, slip of tongue is also known as Freudian slip, which means sometimes you say something and in the very ne next moment you correct it. And then you say, oh, that is not what I meant. You Suddenly you stop it. So this is what you call as a slip of tongue. Now Freud also believed that the unconscious contains life and death instincts. For example, the killing instinct, murdering instinct, suicide. All these things are actually coming from the unconscious. But we push it to the unconscious as they are unacceptable and irrational. Now, Freud believed that bringing the unconscious to the conscious can in many ways relieve psychological disorders. So this is what he tried to apply in his 
clinical aspects with his patients. He has even used free association. Now, free association is actually making a person to say a number of words, disconnected words in one stretch. So, Freud believed that this can really bring out some words hidden in the unconscious. Again, dreams were also used as a mechanism to study the unconscious. So the controversy about this unconscious and the theories put forward by Freud, they still remain. The controversy still exists. Freud's studies were not scientifically proved. So this is one reason. His ideas were completely based on his case studies, not based on the scientific kind of thing, but it was based on his clinical case studies. It still has its relevance in studying about human mind, but how far you can agree with the theory is a different question. So now we are moving on to the next part of psychoanalytical overview, which is actually mirror stage and Lacan. So mirror stage is actually an extension of what Freud suggested, and it was Lacan who put forward this. So Lacan is a French psychologist. He made an impact on many areas and specifically on terms in psychoanalytic theory. Now, mirror stage was first developed by Jacques Lacan. It was inspired by the concepts of Henry Wallen, another French psychologist. So, Lacan used this concept as a springboard to develop his ideas. Now, children after six months enjoy their reflection of mi on mirrors, and this is a psychic response, the first representation of I. So, mirror stage is completely based on these two lines that we have gone through right now. Children after six months will start looking at their own reflections on mirrors. And Lacan says that this is the first time when the concept of I starts getting into their mind. Now, this was written in his essay in 1949 which was actually given as a paper for the 16th Congress of Psychoanalysis. So what exactly is this mirror stage? The infant identifies with the mirror image and this is the emerging perception of selfhood. So you can see the pictures here. The child is looking at the mirror and the child looks very happy with this image. Since his or her motor coordination is comparatively less, they feel the mirror image is an ideal image. So what happens here? The child who is looking at his own mirror image is not having proper motor coordination. Proper motor coordination means the child's brain is not completely developed. And because of that, the child's movements are also restricted. A child cannot move easily just like an adult moves. Because even though it wants to move, it is not an easy process for a child because the motor coordination is not completely proper. Brain development is not completely proper. So since the motor coordination is less, they feel the mirror image is a better image. And for Lacan, this is the first stage where ego is established in a human. So the moment the child feels that the image in the mirror is a better image, an ideal image, that is the first point when ego is established in the child. Now, ego formation and constructions of selfhood happens here. So the baby grows, social interaction happens, and language also comes for the baby. And as a result, there are so many changes happening. So Lacan says that it all begins from this mirror stage. So with this, we come to the end of the session. Now, mirror stage is again divided into imaginary, symbolic, and real, which we will be discussing in the next session. So thank you for your patient listening. Thank you once again. Thank you one and all.